For those who might not know me, my name is Brady Witten, and I welcome you to worship here at First United Methodist Church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I welcome those of you who are here in person and those who are, uh, who are joining us online, uh, at home, wherever you may be. So today is World Communion Sunday. The first, Octo- uh, first Sunday of October is always World Communion Sunday. And so today we will celebrate Jesus, the gospel, and our place in the church with Christians all over the world. And we'll be joining in the Lord's Supper together. But I just ask you to keep in mind as we worship today that Christians all over the globe are worshiping with us and joining in the Lord's Supper. And we're also going to hear a Jesus teaching about Christian service and duty. So I invite you to stand and to join me in the opening prayer for World Communion Sunday. Almighty God, from the ends of the earth, you have gathered us around Christ's holy table. We come to feast together. Have mercy on your church, troubled and divided. Renew us and make us one. O God, we join with our sisters and brothers around the world in remembering Christ's sacrifice for us, for the opportunity to eat and drink together, and for the life we have received. We give you thanks and praise. In the abundance of your many gifts, grant us grace to fill one another's lives with love. Redeem, restore, and remold us until we are made new. Transform our daily bread into the bread of life and the cup that we drink into the cup of salvation. Amen. Today's reading is from the Gospel of Luke. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. The Lord replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your slave who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, come here at once and take your place at the table? Would you not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink? Later you may eat and drink. Do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you are ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In today's reading from Luke, we encounter two Jesus sayings, Uh, and these are not uh, stories about Jesus. They're not parables that Jesus told. They are uh, sayings or teachings or aphorisms of Jesus. And we have one here about faith where Jesus says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to the mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. And we have another here about Christian duty, where basically what Jesus says is, if you do what's required of you, expect no special praise. And uh, the meaning of both of these things, I think, is pretty straightforward. Uh, The first one about mustard seeds, again, uh, has to do with uh, our faith, right? Uh, And I would encourage you not to read this too literally. Uh, When I was a little kid and I would read stuff like listen to the Bible, I literally remember sitting in my front yard sometimes and praying, okay, tree, move from there to there. And it it didn't ever happen. Um, And and I don't think that's what Jesus is trying to point us to. In her book, Short Stories by Jesus, Dr. Amy Jill Levine concludes that Jesus' mustard seed illustration teaches this, even small actions or hidden actions have the potential to produce great things. That's the teaching here. Uh, And again, the second teaching reminds us about service and Christian duty. And Jesus reminds us that when following Him, there will be times when we are asked to put aside our own wants, our own desires, our own needs, and to serve, to serve the cause of Christ, to serve the needy in our midst, to serve the church, uh, and that in fact, if we call ourselves Christians, we have a duty 
to serve. But I think Jesus' point is this, and I hear parents talk about this every once in a while, when my kids will do a chore or something around the house, and sometimes they'll say, okay, Dad, what do I get for doing that? Right? And I know a lot of parents go, well, you don't get anything for doing a chore around the house. You know, now, and maybe you have an arrangement with allowances or things like that, but, you know, you, you get the joy of contributing to the household. That's what you get. Or I've, I'll sometimes say to my kids, you get a roof over your head, and you get food on the table, and you get electricity, and that's what you get, right? Um, and I think Jesus is saying when we do our duty as Christians, when we serve God, we really shouldn't expect any kind of like extra celebration or praise. William Barclay, the great New Testament uh, scholar says this, love always involves responsibility, and love always involves sacrifice. Uh, again, I think parents and others of you, maybe who have been caregivers or something, recognize the truth of that. Love involves responsibility, and it involves sacrifice. And Barclay says, we do not really love Christ unless we are prepared to take on those two things. Uh, and so, there are two things that I want to focus on, and I really want to focus on this teaching about duty, and there's two things I want to say about it. Uh, the first thing I want us to know is that while we do have a duty to serve, duty does not mean drudgery. Any of you have that idea? You think, oh, duty, obligate, oh, I gotta go, gotta go do this. That, it doesn't mean that. Uh, there are times in life where we serve and we sacrifice and we do so gladly and with joy. Let me offer an example. So I was th uh, thinking about a church member this week that I know did something for years and years that took a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of effort. Uh, and I wrote to him and I said, look, I know you used to do this thing. Can you give me a better understanding of what it is you used to do? And there was a lot more to it than I even, even really imagined. Well, this is what he shared to me. See if you can figure it out what we're talking about. He says, so Wednesday evening, my brother and I would make a Sam's or a Costco run and head back to my house to store items in the deep freezer. Friday evening, we'd load the van and trailer, propane, gas, ice chests, and be on location at 5.30 or 6 a.m. Setup consisted of a dozen 10 by 10 tents, a grill, a 35-gallon jambalaya pot, fryers, burners, pots, utensils, a full load of decorations, two TVs with satellite hookups, generator with a sound system. It took our team of 12 people two hours to set up everything, and during the day we'd feed 300 to 1,000 people. And then, of course, we'd have to tear down at the end of the day, clean up, and load the trailer so that it was ready for next time. Anybody got a guess of what we're talking about here? Okay, it is not feeding people after a hurricane or a disaster, I'll tell you that. Uh, this is tailgating for an LSU football game. Uh, and what you just heard was the setup of the Mound Hounds Tiger tailgating, which was led by Chris King and his crew, and they did that every home game for 12 years. But listen to me, that took a whole lot of effort and a whole lot of time. There was physical energy expended and money expended and all of those kinds of things. Uh, and I asked Chris, I said, Chris, why did you do all that? How did you feel about doing all that work? And you know what he answered? I loved every minute of it. Every minute of it. Um, and he actually said to me, they stopped doing it uh, before COVID. And he says, and I really miss it. Right? So the point I want to make again is there are times that we serve and there are times that we sacrifice and there are times that we work hard and we wear ourselves out, but we do it joyfully. Why? Why? Because we love the thing that we're giving ourselves to, right? Uh, so can you think of a time that you served and you gave of yourself gladly because you just loved what you were doing? Well, I think that that's the way that Jesus calls us to love and serve Jesus and his cause and the cause of the kingdom. We should love it. It shouldn't be, oh, I got to go do this thing for Jesus, right? And we see this kind of joyful obedience throughout the New Testament. In Acts 2, 44 and 47, we read this, all the believers were united and shared everything together. Listen to this. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to anyone who needed them. Every day they met together in the temple and ate in their homes. They shared food with gladness and simplicity, and they praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. So this, again, this is a description of the early church. And did you know, they sold pieces of property and possessions and gave them to people in need. And did they do it begrudgingly? What'd you hear there? 
They did so with glad and with generous hearts and praising God in all that they did. Why? Because they knew they were called to something greater and they loved what they were doing and they loved, you know, they had received the love of God and they loved sharing that, that love with others and so they did it gladly. In 2 Corinthians 2.15, we read this. This is Paul writing to the Corinthian church, and he was writing to them about the difficulties of coming to travel and see them. And he says this, 2 Corinthians 12.15, I will very gladly spend and be spent for your sake. I will very gladly spend and be spent for your sake. And so what I want to ask you is, does your vision of the gospel, does your vision of what Jesus has done for you, what Jesus has done for our world, and what you are called to, call you into that kind of joyful service and obedience to say, I will gladly give myself for Jesus and for the kingdom. And I don't have time to go into why I think you should be that way, but I would just encourage you to do this. If you don't have that sense of joyful self-giving in response to what Jesus has done, do some more reading, do some more praying, do some more thinking, open your heart a little bigger, open your mind a little bigger, I think, because when we get it, uh, we, will have, we have no choice but to sort of give ourselves in response to what Jesus has done for us. So I got to tell you that I saw that kind of joyful service in our church's response to the 2016 floods here in Baton Rouge. Uh, so I want to ask a question real quick. How many of you were in Baton Rouge during the 2016 floods? Lots of you. And how many of you were a part of our church during that time? So you have some idea of what our church's response was. If you remember those times, it was, it was amazing, right? So by the time it stopped raining on Sunday, August the 14th, some four trillion gallons of water had been dumped on our community. 40,000 homes were flooded in 20 parishes. So on Monday morning, we put out a call to our church that we would start receiving donations in our gym uh, and that we would begin to send out work teams. Like people started calling us going, what are we going to do? And uh, so we started collecting supplies. By Monday afternoon, our gym was full of supplies. It was amazing. Uh, people brought clothing and diapers and bedding and cleaning supplies and over a thousand pounds of canned goods and food. And families started coming through and they shopped in our gym. They kind of went through and got what they needed. And then we distributed the rest around the community during, during that week. Uh, on Tuesday, our first work teams went out. And by the end of the week, our church had worked in 71 homes. That was in like seven days. We had been in 71 people's homes. Uh, there was a group of volunteers, it was actually Chris King and his Mound, Mound Hound people cooked uh, 500 meals for Red Cross staff and volunteers. On Friday and Saturday, our church sent out a team to Hope Community United Methodist Church in North Baton Rouge, and we began to help them cleaning up their building, and we fed people in their community, giving over a thousand servings of jambalaya out in that community. Uh, we gave away nearly 1,500 flood buckets, and we estimate that at the end of that week, some 400 volunteers had, had worked through our church. And when all was said and done, and when we kind of finally hung up our suspenders on that project, we had over 2,000 volunteers who served through the life of this church and nearly 600 homes in our community, that, uh, lives that we touched. Uh, somebody uh, sent me a little reflection about what that all meant to them, and, and they said this. Now I've got to find my quote for that. I can't find it. Well, here it is. I'm getting old and my eyes are not working as good anymore. <laughs> some people convinced me to get some reading glasses. Maybe I'll use bigger font first. What do you think? Okay. Here's the quote. We have been totally blessed by the volunteers from First United Methodist Church. They have done work not only on our house, but in our family's hearts, right? And the amazing thing was this was tons of work. If any of you participated in this, it was tons and tons of work. It was serving, it was giving, it was sacrificing. But you know what I saw all around us during that time? Joy and focus. And it was like we had come together in this amazing way and we're just serving our neighbors with love because we knew that we were not just bringing food and help, we were bringing Christ to people in their moment of need. And there's just a joy that comes out of that, right? So what I want to ask you to think about a little bit is, uh, in what way are you serving the cause of Christ? in a way that brings you joy. Uh, so, and I don't think as much as I would love for you to be serving in and through this great community of faith, there are lots of other ways to be involved in Christian service, but do you know 
How is it that I am giving my life in the world in Christian service in a way that brings Christ to others and in a way that, you know, it, it, it's a joyful obedience? Because I think that's possible. The second thing that I saw in the time of the great floods and I've seen in other acts of service is that service and duty unite us in an amazingly powerful way. They unite us. So uh, we are living in anxious times. I've, I've said that more times in sermons over the last year or so. We are living in anxious times. People are anxious about our nation, about the divisions, about the fighting. Uh, and I will tell you, I'm, I'm a little concerned about those things too, but I am more concerned that the divisions outside of the church are beginning to manifest themselves inside of the church and that increasingly Christian people no longer see themselves as brothers and sisters in Christ, united in the cause of Christ, but we are calling each other, well, he's a traditionalist and he's a progressive. Well, I know he, he believes this and she thinks that, and we're starting to fight and we're starting to divide over things that really we should not be fighting and dividing over because we have important work to do, and we can't waste time fighting with each other about this stuff. We can't. And it's not that some of the arguments we're having aren't important. We need, we need to have them. Uh, but before all of that, we have work that we have to do for a hurting world. So somebody came up to me at the end of the 8.30 service, and they said, Brady, I can give you a perfect example of how doing our duty and serving unites us. And he said, uh, there was a person in this church, I think they were in a Sunday school class together, he says, and we couldn't stand each other because we would argue about politics all the time, and we were hard on each other. He said, but then during the 2016 flood, we found ourselves mucking out a house together. He says, and we were so busy mucking, we didn't have time to fight. And he says, and we worked the whole day together, and we ate lunch together. And he says, that day of working together changed my perspective on this person forever. I never looked at them the same way again. Uh, and, it was, and it was, again, it was a s serving the cause of Christ and looking for, to the needs of others gets us outside of ourselves and outside of our divisions, and it brings us together. And this is one of the reasons I think that Christ has really called us to serve and to do so dutifully as Christians because he kind of knew that it would be a gift to us. Uh, I'll tell you a quick tip I've learned, too, in my personal life. When I find myself all kind of caught up in my own stuff, Y'all ever do that? Uh, there's a great expression I uh, learned years ago. Uh, the smallest package in the world is a person who's all wrapped up in themselves. And look, we all do it, right? It, but you ever get in that state where you go, like, you're thinking about my feelings and my needs and my wants, and I'm not getting what I want? You know one of the greatest ways that you can turn that around? Lift your head up and look outside yourself and look at other people and their needs and their wants and go out and do what? serve them and love them and try to tend to their needs. And all of a sudden, your problems, not that they go away, but they suddenly find a, a perspective that can be helpful and you can figure out a way, a way to move forward. Serving and doing our duty together for Christ unites us, right? So today is World Communion Sunday. It's a day that we celebrate Jesus. We celebrate the gospel. We celebrate our place together in this room around this table as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we celebrate the way that this mission and this family that we've been called to unites us with Christians all over the world. So as we celebrate, I just ask you when we hear the words of the Lord's Supper to remember what Christ has done for us in giving himself. And remember who Christ has called us to be as the church, and let us serve him and come together in joyful obedience. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.